tardes, mi nombre es Fernando Pérez, soy director del doctorado en Estudios Mediales y estamos muy contentos hoy de tener acá a Erki Jutamo, quien es profesor de la Universidad de California en Los Ángeles eh, y un referente muy importante en el campo de la arqueología medial. De hecho, estábamos en conversaciones con él para venir eh, justo antes de los acontecimientos de 2020 que todos recordamos. Eh, y nos alegra mucho haber conseguido que finalmente se materializara esta visita. Eh, el profesor Jutamo dio un pequeño seminario para nuestros estudiantes de este programa doctoral que está recién comenzando. Eh, conversó con, con académicos, eh, con investigadores, eh, y hoy día nos presenta esta charla pública abierta sobre su trabajo en la tópica de la arqueología medial. Eh, y aprovecho de agradecer también al Centro de Estudios Mediales que colaboró con esta actividad, de hecho con el vino de honor que tenemos a continuación. Así que muchas gracias a todos y todas por estar aquí eh, y los dejo con el profesor Erki Jutamo, a quien agradezco una vez más. Thank you very much. All right, so thank you very much for the um, kind uh, introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me to um, share some ideas about my research here in Santiago de Chile at the Universidad Alberto Hurtado. It's, a, it's an honor for me and I'm uh, very uh, curious about uh, your, um, your uh, reactions, your uh, responses also to this uh, lecture. So um, in this lecture, uh, I am concentrating on a quite well-known uh, concept in uh, contemporary media culture, um, a concept that many people consider to be uh, rather recent, um, so very much part on the, of the present, but not so much of the past. And um, so uh, from a media archaeological perspective, I am trying to hopefully show that the um, issue Uh, of the cyborg is uh, actually much more complex, much more perhaps broad than that. And also uh, in this lecture, I am trying to um, demonstrate to you that the cyborg can be um, talked about uh, what I call a topos, a certain kind of a cliche or commonplace, an idea that keeps on traveling in time and it's uh, picked up over and over again and given uh, new meanings. So when we um, talk about the cyborg, obviously we should begin by uh, talking about our understanding of that word. And um, very uh, quickly when we research cyborgs, we notice that there is uh, not uh, absolute uh, agreement about what this word might mean. For example, we could um, uh, quote um, rather well-known uh, eccentric billionaire Elon Musk, who in one interview stated, you are already a cyborg and most people don't even realize that phone in your hand is an extension Uh, of yourself. We could also talk about um, cultural figures like Steve Mann, uh, who is a pioneer of so-called life logging. So this means uh, devices that Steve Mann has been uh, wearing, using permanently to record his surroundings and also sort of like provide information about his own life. Uh, using communication media as a lifestyle, but also as a mean of, means of identity formation. So Steve Mann has also been many times been characterized as a cyborg. Or we could make a simple internet search for the word cyborg. Uh, look at the kind of images that, that it uh, brings up. This is a way I, how I often uh, sort of like try to measure the certain kind of popular appeal of certain concepts. 
So these are the kind of images that you uh, get in response to the word cyborg. We could also read the news and, um, and look at news sites, including, uh, in this case, CNN, an article saying, US military spending millions to make cyborgs a reality, obviously meaning uh, uh, soldiers uh, provided with new and um, emerging technologies to enhance their powers within the, on the battlefield. Or we could look at a couple of people who like to call themselves cyborgs, and one of them would be the prize fighter from Brazil, Chris Cyborg. Here again, we have to ask this question that I asked before. What is it that makes Chris Cyborg or Cyborg? Or is it just a kind of a fashionable label that seems to be fitting to that kind of uh, sports? Or we could take a, another self-described cyborg, the Australian artist Stellark, um, who has been exploring the symbiosis between the body and technology, both externally and internally, since the 1970s. Stellark famously built a robotic third arm that, that took uh, commands from his muscles. And he built an exoskeleton to move around combined with an artificial uh, skeleton. He once organized an exhibition in his stomach using uh, little uh, robotic devices that he swallowed. And, and the exhibition had to be observed through, through the image of an endoscopic camera that followed his, down his throat after that exhibition. Uh, he has also given many performances together with industrial robots controlled by his bodily functions. So raising questions about the relationship between humans and robots and, and the certain kind of links and connections and perhaps also differences between those kind of organisms, uh, natural and artificial organisms. Um, famously, or should we say notoriously, Stellark uh, also um, inserted technology into his, uh, under his skin, as in this project, which is called the third year he did it. So he was planning to uh, provide technological uh, sound capabilities for this third artificial ear that was that was inserted in, inside his arm. That didn't really work that well that he was planning and actually caused some serious medical problems for, for Stellark for a while. And then we could take another example, Neil Harbison, who has gained a lot of uh, uh, attention on the internet uh, by claiming that he has an antenna that has been implanted into his skull for the purpose of hearing colors, so being a person claiming to be uh, colorblind. So using a technological device to sort of like compensate for um, certain kind of lack in the sensorium. And um, Neil Harbison has been posing as a model for so-called transhuman existence. Um, when you read articles published by Harbison on the internet, you often uh, need to ask questions on what, what level this is real, on what level this may be just uh, imagined or pretended kind of cyborg relationship. I still haven't found a clear answer whether this um, antenna has really been inserted into the skull and whether it really has those rather strange, rather, rather far out uh, uh, functions that Neil Harbison often claims this um, antenna to have. In any case, I guess that uh, these examples can read for, lead to questions, for example, 
um, like this one. So making us ask whether the mode of connecting the extend extension to the body matters. Uh, does body mounted differ from something which is handheld? Like in these uh, two uh, questions. And we might even want to ask whether the cyborg is, is more than just this kind of claims about a uh, relationship between bodies and technology, but also about a uh, relationship bet between the physical body and the mind. For example, asking a question, do cyborgs stream of mobile phones? Um, you may have noticed that on the internet, you can actually found, find sources that uh, talk about uh, mobile phones uh, and their meanings in people's dreams. So in, in other words, so mental attachment to the device may be important for understanding also social uh, so cyborg logic. And I think that it, it definitely um, is important to ask what is, what, is the, the, what is the meaning of continuous or intermittent use of this kind of devices. So sometimes uh, these devices are permanently part of the body or attached to the body. Sometimes they are only uh, encountering the body from time to time. And this issue may be important when we try to sort of like to understand what we actually are talking about. So defined simply, uh, I think we can say that the cyborg is a technologically extended or augmented human being or animal. So animals can also have cyborg-like cyborg uh, extensions and features. The cyborg's extensions can be external, so attached to the skin, or internal, so inserted inside the body, or they can be both. So we should ask, is this a sufficient or even an interesting definition? And this is because humans have been using tools since prehistorical times. So have they always been cyborgs? How much does the nature and function of those tools matter? Um, I, in this lecture, will try to go a little bit deeper into those kind of questions. So if we look at some of the um, writings, some of the mo most um, important and interesting writings about the cyborg, I think that this idea of cyborg having a longer ex 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 existence than just being a, a feature of the contemporary techno discourse often comes up. This was already the case in the very first book which I believe was ever written about the cyborg which was this book by Daniel Hallacy on the left called Cyborg Evolution of the Cyb Superman, published in the beginning of the 1960s. This is actually still a very interesting book to read. And, um, and in that book, uh, really, um, Hallacy uh, excavates what we could call a kind of a deep history of the cyborg, going back very far back in the past, so basically thousands of, of years. Or we might look at another remarkable book, which I think that anyone doing research on the cyborg should read. This is uh, the book by Alison Murray called The Enlightenment Cyborg, A History of Communications and Control in the Human Machine between 1660 and 1830. In that book, um, Alison Murray, which I, I don't have time to talk about in detail in this lecture, uh, clearly shows that the kind of issues that the cyborg discussion has been raising in the past few decades are nothing uh, new. Uh, they have been projected to a different kind of a technological er environment, but, but have been asked many, many times already back in the past. In, indeed, I, I think that this book by Alison Murray could be considered a kind of a, a, a media archaeological exploration of the cyborg, even though the book doesn't use the word 
word media archaeology. Now, if we ad adopted this kind of a perspective, we could, for example, look at uh, things like this um, fake toe found from an Egyptian tomb, which was attached to a, to a mummy and sometimes is called the world's first prosthetic. Or famously, if we did a research on the medical history of augmenting or preparing, uh, fixing the body, we could, of course, look at Ambrua, Ambrua Paré's famous mechanical prosthetic body parts from the 16th century. And I think that there are ways following the line of, for example, those authors I, I, I just mentioned, in which these examples really can be connected somehow to, to that, that, that deep history of the cyborg. But because that has been done by those scholars, I'm not going to do that in this lecture. So I'm actually trying to present you uh, something which might be a little bit different kind of a genealogy of the cyborg, uh, adding certain elements that haven't been taken, taken much into account at, at all, I think. But before I get to that part of the presentation, I think it is worth having a closer look briefly at the coining of the word cyborg. Because we, we do not necessarily often uh, spend enough time with the etymology of the concepts we are using. So we use concepts, but we really don't fully know always where they come from, what were, the, what were their original meanings, and how have those meanings changed in time. So let me spend a little bit time with the, with the origins of the word cyborg. And these origins take us to these two, two guys posing, posing here uh, in a newspaper photo uh, from 1960. So, as you can see, this is a history that in this sense goes back already over half a century. So the word cyborg comes from the words cybernetic organism. And the word was coined by two medical doctors in the United States, Dr. Manfred Kleins and Dr. Nathan S. Klein, who both worked in a, in an, uh, in a hospital in, in, the, in New York City. And they together wrote a paper um, on, in 1960 for a conference on space medicine and bioastronautics. And this paper was published as Cyborgs in Space in the journal Astronautics in September 1960. So here we get to the, uh, I wouldn't say to the origins of the cyborg history, but to the origins of the word cyborg in that sense, as a sort of like a uh, sort of like determinant for that, that history. And the, um, obviously, the word cyborg brings back to um, back, back brings to mind the word cybernetics, which was a new science that had been uh, presented uh, less than 20 years earlier, um, and uh, was gaining a lot of attention in the 1950s and early 1960s. And it was especially some aspects of the work done by so-called cyberneticians in the early times that influenced the um, um, clients and Klein to adopt the word, coin the word cy cyborg. And these were the aspects of, of the work of prosthetics that was created by some uh, early cyberneticians and the work on bodily uh, homeostasis. So the way how, how, how the internal processes in the body create a certain kind of, for example, try to create balance and also compensate for, for internal medical uh, uh, um, emergencies and things like that. So this was uh, the side of cybernetics that was contributed largely by the Mexican uh, medical doctor Arturo Rosenblut, 
uh, who worked together with Norbert Wiener, the scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the team around these two, two people. So the uh, cybernetics um, obviously was launched by this book that was written by Wiener, but with the help from Rosenbluth and many others, published in 1948. And let me just uh, mention, uh, in case you um, uh, don't know or have, you, have not thought, thought about this, where this word cybernetics came from. So it came from the Greek root called kubernetes, which means steersman or helmsman. Actually, it was a word that had been used in French before, cybernetic, already in the 1830s by André-Marie Ampère. But this was obviously a connection that, that Wiener was not aware of when he coined this word with the team. And so cy cybernetic obviously is a science of command and control systems and a theory of self-regulating organisms with a famously central concept, feedback. So like a steersman trying to um, guard a boat on the sea or on a river, uh, the uh, people uh, uh, in, engaged in um, uh, sort of like air, air defense in the Second World War, used cybernetic principles to compensate for factors like wind and the speed of the airplanes that they were trying to shoot down from the skies and things like that. So uh, using this idea about feedback uh, based on also naturally mat mathematical and geo geo geometric calculations. So out of that background, um, cyborgs and space, um, the idea about cyborg started uh, emerging. So what Kleins and, 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 and Klein were trying to do, were trying to sort of like uh, come up with an idea, a solution for future space travel. So the idea, how could the human body be uh, modified or changed or augmented so that it could endure possibly years long travel out into the deep space. And their idea was that this idea would, would happen internally. So to make long space voyages possible, clients and uh, clients and clients suggested insecting pharmaceuticals into the astronaut's body by internal osmotic pumps to regulate fluid intake and output, oxy oxygenization and cardiovascular control, rather than using external machinic augmentations. So this system would be something that would be basically like functioning inside the body on a continuous basis, keeping the body alive uh, rather than, so, uh, so to make it endure that kind of challenges that normal life you know, on, on, on planet Earth doesn't, doesn't require. This led to extensive experimentation with animal research, which I will save you from showing those rather horrifying pictures about what was done for mice and, mice and, uh, and monkeys and other, other animals to test these ideas around cyborg uh, along the, these lines. Instead, I will briefly show you a couple of uh, pub public uh, uh, sort of like uh, repercussions. So because it is really interesting that this word cyborg very quickly uh, became known widely, started spreading in the, in the media of the time, especially magazines and, uh, and the newspapers. And, and sort of like it, within a number of months was, was sort of like on many people's lips. Um, one of the first articles was published in the Life magazine uh, just a few months or we few weeks after it had been presented. It's called Man Remade to Live in Space. And I, kill, I will read this uh, very briefly, this quotation. Striding buoyantly across the low gravity surface of the moon, there may someday be strange new men, part human, part machine, like the ones above, so in the previous picture. They will have a strange name, cyborgs, 
for cybernetic organisms. Cyborgs, according to a daring new idea, will be men whose body organs and systems are automatically adjusted for life in unearthly environments by artificial organs and senses. Some of these devices will be attached, others actually implanted by surgery. Articles kept on appearing, many illustrations kept on appearing, and the word started spreading in culture. I just show you a couple of rather funny looking uh, examples. Must tomorrow's men look like this? Asked Popular Science in October 1963. And this is a picture from Miami News uh, on the right. Um, there would be much to say about the relationship between um, cybernetics and cyborgs, but, but I will not have time here to talk about this topic in details. But, but as Ronald Klein, um, uh, an important scholar, has um, indicated, the relationship was never uh, absolutely obvious and clear, even though they, uh, the origin of the word came from cy cybernetics. So there were clear differences in the, in the attitude towards uh, scientists interested in those ideas. And actually the word cyborg really appeared in um, scientific texts in the 60s and 70s, but very often in popular culture, often in connection or even sort of like seen as an uh, interchangeable with another word, bionic. Uh, this is another topic that would be interesting to talk about for, for length, but this is a rather short lecture. This is one of the early artworks inspired by the cyborg by Paul van Hoydonk from 1968-69 called Homo Cyber Cyberneticum. Bionic man or cyborg? This was a question that I think um, 60s and the early 70s discussion often raised. For example, the um, television series like The Six Million Dollar Man, based on Martin Caitlin's novel from 1976. So even though very often in popular culture there wasn't a clear uh, distinction made between cyborg and bionic, we can say that the bionic implies the increasing replacement of biological body parts with artificial organs. So, so there is a, li a relationship between these things, but the, the, the more body parts are replaced by, in imagination or reality, by technological element, the closer to the bionic uh, we seem to be get from the concept cyborg. Some Japanese examples. A very important and interesting um, um, moment for the uh, discussion of cy about cyborg um, in the academic world, but also from uh, cultural activism, feminist activism, and so on, happened when, in 1995, the, um, the um, scholar Donna Haraway uh, adopted, the, or we, could, we could even say hijacked, the cyborg notion and turned it into what she called a myth about the post-human condition. So this happened in the famous manifesto for the cyborgs uh, Haraway published. So here, uh, Heiborg deliberately, so, so Haraway deliberately adopted the concept from the male techno science and gave it a radically different meaning. So for Haraway, the idea of cyborg indicated erasure of multiple boundaries. Uh, and these would be boundaries between human and technology, but also between human, animal, and nature. Haraway presented the idea as an iron, like uh, um, she said, ironic myth for liberation in a postmodern spirit. So Haraway's technoscientific thought undermined male supr supremacy and the human exceptionalism in favor of coexistence with forms of what she called significant otherness. 
So, so it was not about just about the question about the 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 organics or the human and the technological, but but extend it to to other such encounters where problematic uh, certain kind of like mergers and ruptures were were happening in culture. This, as you surely know, this became a highly important and influential um, concept in the. Uh, cultural theoretical, techno, technocultural theoretical discourse almost the Im immediately when it was published, this, uh, this piece. So, although rooted in an existing context, so military technoscience, Haraway's cyborg was a prophecy about an emergent cultural condition. Haraway's, Haraway's cyborg was an iconoclastic creature committed to partiality, irony, intimacy, and perversity. It merged feminism with radical technoscientific speculation. So Haraway was, was truly quite radical in what she was trying to do, and there would be much to say about this. This quotation is, is my favorite from that, that manifesto. So Haraway wrote, being human is now passé, the body is the ultimate source of salvation, the only resource of one's redemption. The body as a tech design object, the body as a technology of the post subject. Accordingly, body modification by means of techno science is the key to the perfectibility of the post human being. Now, Cultural theorists started commenting on that issue, as I mentioned, and some, not everybody was very welcoming to the idea. For example, Suhail Malik, who wrote in, in the Mute ma magazine in England, ironically suggested that Haraway's feminist ideal already existed in the figure of Michael Jackson, who, who had famously engaged into, into highly controversial actions that, that affected the, the body of somebody who was born as a black person and who's actually become a very problematic figure in the cultural discussion of today. In many ways, thinking about the, the kind of deep debates that we are, we are having along, along the idea about race, gender, identity, activism, things like that. So, I'm getting now closer to the other section of this lecture. Um, so, I guess that one of the questions we should ask, is the cyborg a human perfected by added alien elements or a token of the human's gradual disintegration and disappearance? Where does human end and post-human and non-human begin? So I think that this is probably for the contemporary discussion one of the most um, uh, interesting and also volatile questions. This is basically the question that, that is related already to the 1960s thinking about uh, uh, somehow uh, about this sort of like erasure of boundaries between the uh, cyborg and, uh, and, uh, and the bionic and also cyborg and the robot that which I didn't mention but no too many things to say about cyborgs versus robots. Um, I have been playing with the idea that perhaps we could um, develop something I call the human, post, human cyborg post-human scaling tool, which on the one end would have a human, as we have known it for a long, long time on this planet, and on the other hand we would have something which we could call the post-human, which could be an AI, an entity with certain kind of elements and qualities of the human. And in the middle here, we would have the cyborg, which is the moment of a merger between some of those elements and, and qualities. And in, in my way of thinking, so the, some of these questions we should ask perhaps can be uh, uh, represented by these arrows in the bottom. So do we actually talk about uh, an unavoidable uh, permanent transition to one direction or rather about some kind of a 
interplay between these different elements and aspects and with potential consequences sometime in the, in the future. These are uh, issues I, I talk at much greater length in my forthcoming book. Uh, so in this <laughs> previous, uh, in this brief lecture, I can only sort of like give you a little hint about some of those, those things. Now, uh, the rest of this presentation, uh, I will um, try to rather, pre rather quickly um, spend with a little bit different way of looking at the uh, history or the kind of genealogy of the, of the cyborg. Um, this is a, what I might call a topos archaeological, media archaeological topos study approach. And I came to think about these ideas, as I, it often happens to me, through a chance discovery. So it all began while I was leafing through an airline magazine on a transcontinental flight. And I saw this um, advertisement for uh, noise cancelling um, headphones. So what I was interested in, of course, was this uh, imaginary about, obviously, ladies with those loudspeaker heads. And what interested me was that I instantaneously thought about other cases. For example, Lynn Hirschman's, um, so Fra San Francisco-based media artist Lynn Hirschman's photo montages, a series called Phantom Limbs, women's where the parts part of their bodies have been uh, replaced by technological devices, media technological devices. Or about other much earlier um, things like this trade card with woman with a with a telephone head. Mr. Phonograph, man with the phonograph head, um, I imag imagination, uh, something inspired by an interaction of Edison's phonograph, the first successful uh, device for repro reproducing and playing back sounds. So were all these things somehow connected or were they just randomly associated by my own mind? Is there some kind of structure in, out there that makes sense of these things or did I just fantasize myself? It's a question that uh, I think a media archaeologist always has to ask from oneself. Now. Those ideas were all around. It doesn't take much to check the internet or go to events like cosplay parties or, or comic conventions to find figures like this. So I started researching this topic in the social media and I quickly noticed that many people doing these things had little idea why they were doing it. Internet searches bring back a lot of such images and if you look at the one in the middle in the bottom so you can actually see a clear link with the kind of images that inspired me to think about cyborgs in this sense. I started calling this kind of things a gadget head and then I noticed that on the internet people were calling them object heads. Object head is probably a larger category than the gadget head, which is about the technological devices. These things uh, may have complex genealogies that are worth investigating, and it thinks I look like looks like the popularity of Japanese culture and Japanese popular culture plays a role right here, and it actually goes further back in, in Japanese culture, the representation of Japanese yokai, house spirits or ghosts, which are often shown associated with uh, everyday objects uh, merging with the body. So, would be much to say about this, but this often happens when in the Japanese animism, a uh, um, well-used object is abundant the object finally gets a certain kind of a soul and, and sort of like 
as gets associated with the body. Where did these object heads and gadget heads come from? So I in, engaged on a, on a deep and long research journey to go back in time. And I'm showing you that moments of that journey just briefly because so that we will have a little bit of time to discuss as well. But uh, these are moments uh, in the, shall we say, in the genealogy of what I might call the discursive cyborg. So not so, not so much about those physical cyborgs that I talked about in the beginning, and for example, that uh, talked about Alison Murray's book, the, the Enlightenment Cyborg. This kind of um, story that I'm, I'm uh, uh, trying to reconstruct is a certain kind of a, I think, compensation for that. It's a, it's a companion. So uh, in my way of thinking, uh, imaginary, discursive, and co concrete material, concrete things, always uh, uh, sort of like interact with each other as these motives and ideas uh, appear in different kind of cultural contexts. So instead of going to these things in detail, so let me just basically show you a kind of a gallery of ideas. And if uh, these are interesting for you, so there will be a time in the near future when you can read more closely uh, what I make out of this in, from, that, from that, that new book. It's called The Fairy Engine that, that uh, should, be, should appear. But I mean that um, in, in this kind of history, we should look at the, uh, the imagination of mergers between the body and, and artificial or edit, added elements. And it's quite interesting that in this case, I think one element we need to research are these monstrous uh, hybrid creatures that we often find in medieval imagination, for example, um, uh, which is a creature is a hybrid between human and animal. So this is not how, how the original, so uh, Kleins and Klein imagined the cyborg, but it is much more along the line of Don Haraway's thinking of, of the cyborg. As I mentioned, so Haraway refused to think about cyborg just in terms of the inter encounter between the technological and the human, but also brought other boundaries and mergers, including humans and animals, into that picture. Um, so there is a huge amount of material about animal-headed gods, evangelists, saints, and righteous men, like in this remarkable article by Zofia Amezanova. There is a tradition of composite heads that, uh, for example, the famous paste paintings by Giuseppe Ar Ar Argimbaldo, which would be worth uh, thinking about, and the history of um, um, perhaps works that were influenced by Argimbaldo or trajectories that influenced Argimbaldo from the other direction. What is interesting in this tradition is that we see how little by little uh, compositions of humans made out of composite elements start incorporating technological elements and tools as symbolic manifestations of professions of these people, like in this remarkable pair of uh, sort of like enigmatic uh, engravings called Humani Victus in Instrumenta from the time close to the time when Arjim Baldo was making those paintings in the, in the, in the court of the, uh, in the imperial court in uh, Prague uh, during, during the 16th century. Um, this tradition could be followed throughout centuries to il illustrations like this, which is supposed to, supposed to be the inventor's head, which uh, obviously is you see kind of like a technological merger of those elements and the head. Don't go into it uh, except very briefly here. Um, we always uh, need to ask questions about 
interconnections, influences between traditions, or also sometimes traditions that, that run parallel and may, may not have influenced each other. For example, the Japanese visual culture knows, knows um, wonderful and interesting and enigmatic examples of figures of made out of composite elements, so basically mergers of incompatible features. I will show you a couple of examples very briefly and then I will stop. Um, cyborg idea obviously is related also with the idea of dressing up in technology so and merging with those, those, those ele elements. So if we accept the fact that the cyborg can be a figure that is wearing uh, things rather than things really merging with, with bodies. Here we could talk about uh, graphical uh, traditions like showing figures like this or this and analyze these certain kind of uh, imaginary forms. These are also related with the imagination of professions, human professions. So human figures depicted by the tools but in some cases, like in the left, uh, going so far that the elements of the body are radically changed. So the, um, the, the outfit becomes merged and inseparable from the body itself. So this means the imagination leads to the creation of a, of a, of a new kind of creature. We could look at ideas about dressing up in photography which became a fashion in the 19th century after the introduction of photography in 1839. Uh, for example, um, fashion plates show uh, ladies wearing camera hats and, and dressed up in photographic uh, pictures. Could be, there were many other variations of this in the 19th century. Um, some symbolic meanings impersonations, uh, sort of like post-plastic type of posings, uh, advertising poses, wearing, um, um, wearing uh, products um, that, that, that the lady was supposed to, often a lady was supposed to advertise. Um, pal ballet performances, ladies impersonating techno new technology, and even more mysterious creations like the Japanese gutai artist Atsuko Tanaka's electric dress from 1956, where this very radical uh, female artist uh, created a kind of an outfit that was lit and, and uh, sort of like electrified during the performances she gave with it. Obviously, I believe, without being aware of the idea that the idea of dressing up in te technology was already a kind of a topos variant in the Western context. In the case of Atsuko Tanaka, the idea was perhaps related with something else, which would be, of course, the traditional Japanese outfit of the kimono. So electric dress as an iconoclastic kimono I actually, many years ago, I wanted to test this idea by um, discussing with Atsuko Tanaka uh, these, these questions personally when I was in Japan. Uh, sadly, she died like two weeks before I was able to meet her. So I never got the answer. And my final example briefly has to do with this strange creature here. Uh, inspired also by the photography. So the highly interesting and, and, and rich imaginary photography inspired often raised questions about encounters between humans and technology in various different forms. Here, uh, obviously, in a case 
in a way where the human encounters an, a strange artificial creature. But soon this imagination connected these photographic cameras and the humans into which seems to be some kind of a new monster with a single eye, idea that was seen often as a threat and, and fearful thing in modern, mo like early modern society. So people wrote about one-eyed monsters, meaning photographic cameras. This cartoon from 1963 is highly interesting because it appeared in the context of the Darwinian theory that had been uh, uh, published uh, by Charles Darwin in uh, 1859, the selection of species. So this cartoonist imagined and make a kind of a joke about the curious animal that had been seen going about loose the other day. Uh, and obviously this animal was a now a hybrid of the photographic camera and the human. So they, the merger had been happening and as a certain kind of a little bit tongue-in-cheek commentary on Charles Darwin's ideas. Here obviously the important element is that the human eyes have been replaced by the single eyed of Homo monstruosus, uh, identified with uh, the cyborg. Now, uh, uh, sorry, I mean the cyclops. Now, if we follow this idea uh, more to more recent times, we would actually be see how artists like Alex Boya, uh, in this work called Monster Cam have actually uh, sort of like associated these, these things together. Then this um, uh, interesting bronze statue, there seems to be an interpretation that says that this new hybrid is either created or is the devil himself. Because when we look at the statue from above, we actually see a face, face that iconographically matches the classical uh, representation of the devil in the Western tradition. Actually, the idea, the statue took its form from this advert advertisement for a photographic company. Interesting uh, is to see how these ideas can travel in, in culture. For example, in the, in the form of um, uh, photographic self-portraits by professional photographers. So, we could follow the way how, uh, since the 1920s at least, uh, radical photographers by Germain Krull started giving uh, posing in compositions like that, where you actually see that the camera which obviously is an extension of the human eye, is actually presented to be more than that. It is presented to be a hybridized, uh, 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 like hybridized together with the body of the photographer. Sometimes the, the element is a bit, a little bit uh, less extreme, like in this famous self-portrait with the Leica by Ilse Bing from 1931 where Bing actually makes it clear that her facial profile is seen, even though she chooses to pose behind the Leica camera. This, of course, happens by using the mirror on the left. But what I'm really interested in is this motif that is repeated over and over again, like in this Ambos uh, self-portrait, posing with the Leica again, where really one of the eyes has been turned into an artificial mechanical eye of the camera. And of course, uh, there is a hidden story behind this particular photograph, which is kind of tragic story, is that Ambo actually lost sight in that eye that is behind the camera in an accident, just be shortly before this photo was taken. So it was in a concrete sense a replacement in this photograph for that eye he no longer had. Or oh, Andreas Feininger's famous series uh, of, uh, photo of photos, uh, most famous being the photojournalist for Life magazine 1955. 
uh, this is the elements of the whole series where again the idea of professions uh, and artificial substitutes or extensions of the body became a theme so it was not only about the photographic camera becoming merged with the with the with the with the photographer but but with with variations of all kinds of professionals associated with technological extensions was part of this Feininger's famous photographic series. And um, uh, this is actually Dennis Stock, um, a photographer who was uh, in that, that, that photojournalist photo posing with two artificial eyes of the cameras. And this is um, Bruce Gilden, Magnum, a paparazzo photo photographer, celebrating oneself as a one-eyed monster. Recycling of a topos like this easily can be found from commercial stock images sold on the internet. I'm very intrigued about the idea that a huge tradition developed around the smartphone, which is the mirror selfie, which often is based on the idea of hiding your face behind or parts of behind it. Obviously, there are many reasons for this, because in some of these, the people are actually posing naked, as, as you surely have, uh, surely know. And then we can could jump over to uh, Apple's um, uh, efforts to emphasize the security and privacy of using the iPhone, where this topos jumps on these billboards. For example, in this case, shown during the COVID-19 lockdown in Los Angeles, I took the photo in a totally abandoned city, as, as you can see, where I was just walking alone and, and encountered this billboard. So this is, um, um, I'm, I, I need to finish this, this talk here, but, um, and, and, and um, you see clearly that this is an incomplete work uh, because I cannot give you all these elements and details from what I have written in the book. So this was maybe more like a sneak preview. So uh, starting from looking at some of those questions and issues around the cyborg and its definition, and then in the second half of the speech, trying to give you a certain kind of an alternative way of looking at that kind of, a, shall we say, cyborg geneal genealogy, making the point that not only the concrete material mergers matter, but also the imagination that always surrounds these ideas, and also the fact that these things can be taken to a very, very uh, long, huge cultural spaces and interactions between these kind of uh, cultural spaces. Um, as, a, as a final uh, question, perhaps I should just ask, are these uh, observations generally valid or only within the Western tradition? And how would things change if we observe the cyborg from some other cultural, ethnic, racial, gender-related points of views? I think that there are many other cyborgs many uh, other cyborg identities will that will little a little by little show up so that means that the excavation will have to uh, continue but this is um, now going to be the point where i have taken them at this point so i thank you for your attention Y ahora tenemos rato para algunas preguntas eh, y pueden ser en, directamente en inglés. Les paso el micrófono. Si alguien quiere, yo puedo hacer de intermediario y traduzco, eh, aunque el profesor entiende bastante castellano. Eh, Wolfgang. Thank you very much for your um, lecture. So my, my question is about the first part, about the concept of the cyborg. So it seems to me that there is one way to connect the various uses of the term, namely by saying that um, there is 
the long-standing and ongoing history of the human being, whereby the human being becomes ever more cyborg, so ever more extends itself, augments itself, transforms itself through technology. Um, and at a, so development, there would be a gradual development. And the development wherein we have the tendency to see the past of that development, that is, the tools that are already integrated into our existence as something natural. For example, one of the most common tools that everybody was, uh, of us uses every, every day is clothes. And we don't tend to see them as a piece of technology. We don't tend to see them as, as a tool. So then in that, in that picture, one might say that the various, like Haraway and, and Kleins and Klein, when they originally used the term, they put the, 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 the threshold of um, what degree of, of augmentation through technology makes a human being a cyborg, they put that threshold at different parts of that continuum. So my question was, is whether what you said about the scaling tool, actually whether you wanted to suggest something like that, or, or whether the idea there is different from that, that idea of a gradual ongoing development of cyborgization, so to speak, of the human being. Yeah. Thank so you. the um, yes, thank you for the question. I think that these are these are some of the very basic and important questions we need to talk about when we we talk about the cyborg. I I mentioned in my speech this um, very little read book these days, which is this Hallas is um, the first book on the cyborg uh, published as a reaction very very quickly after that word had been uh, sort of like made public. So that book basically makes, uh, makes a very clear point about this certain kind of a, so we say almost natural link, you know, like thinking um, um, sort of like certain kind of cyborgian element in the human uh, cultural evolution, you know, the idea that as soon as humans started using uh, tools, you know, so in, in a certain way, uh, they were already on this trail that at some point, much, much later, became named, nominated uh, cyborg. So there's a certain kind of a continuity. It's not a simple continuity because it has many kind of side paths and, and some, you know, that kind of jumps and things like that. But at the same time, it, it definitely, like you say, it raises this question about uh, so this this other side of the argument is always this uh, question about the rupture or the or the significance of those some kind of changes or mutations or whatever that that happen within this trajectory. So this is basically the continuity versus some kind of rupture or a kind of a kind of jump jump up in in uh, problematics or. Uh, quality of those augmentations and that kind of things. And I actually, Halasi did understand that as well. So he, he had a certain kind of feeling that, that this, especially this medical problematics um, that, that, um, that Klein and Klein, Klein's and Klein um, sort of like so as very centrally um, involved with the idea about cybernetic was, was sort of like probably taking this problematics on another level from, for example, compared with the um, um, Ambrose Paris, um, sort of like mechanical moving prosthesis that he uh, proposed already like a half a, half a mill millennium uh, before that. So that kind of thing. But I'm not sure that this can be um, immediately and, and like, like in a simple way connected with this my hypothetical um, sort of like cyborg post-human measuring, measuring tool. Even though, so, so maybe the emphasis is slightly, slightly different in that sense, in the, in the way that, so that, so, so that recently, so we have seen this, this question about like, uh, so cyborg is, is somehow the problem with the cyborg is, 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 is related with this um, bionic, question. So cyborg uh, somehow emer emerges when something is something external is added to the body. But when, when the external is taking over, uh, 
more and more parts are being ex exchanged, so then you get to the bionic. But, but robots, robotic, is, a, is, a, is a parallel creature, so to say. Uh, so uh, ro I p didn't talk about robots, which is a kind of a pity because we didn't have time here. But a robot is is not the same as cyborg, obviously, because robot is an artificial creature that may imitate certain human elements. But but then uh, I think that the really interesting questions are being asked by ChatGPT and uh, artificial intelligence these these days. When, when, which is basically like, like robot in the sense that it is separate from the, from the, from from the human body. It's it's basically imitates the logic of the of of the human, that that kind of thing. So the question is simply like, I, I don't have an immediate answer to that, but like, how do we deal with the certain kind of interplay of these 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 various elements and components with the, with each other? So it's, I think it's more like a cultural, philosophical uh, question. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, I've taken some notes while I listened to you, um, especially in the aspect of cyber, we know the, big, the first question in the new beginning is that we are cyborgs in our first tools, and, and this is, of course, we, we're taking uh, Andre Leroy Wuhan with, with his text about uh, humanization of humans, and, and then Bernard Stiegler extended this, this point of view of Andre Leroy Wuhan talking about uh, organological aspects of human beings with external tools that is in the, in the sense of, of our own faculties or our own biological aspects change in the time with, 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 the, with the artifact that we create. But my question is about the aspect of planetary conditions nowadays that you're taking in some aspect with the ethics of Haraway in the aspect of entropy and negentropy. Uh, in the sense of we, how do you see these links between uh, the coordination and comprehension between human beings and the tools that you created? How do you see this this humanization, this sterilization in this as in two aspects? I think it's the problem: this coordination and delegation, and, and this is the, end, the 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 problem of the, this uh, black box that we created and, and this entropy of, of many tools that we, we made at uh, any time. And, and my other question is: How do you see in this subjectivity? Because in, in some aspect we are we we have a, a subjectivity of cybers with, with, the, with the tools that we use every day at least for me, uh, or for Stigler too. <laughs> but um, how do you see this, this uh, aspect of change in subjectivity by interobjectivity? How we objectivize these mediums as, as a medium, as our own constitution, you know? as, as, as a cyber constitution as we, as we are nowadays with, with these tools that we're mediating every day. This, this is my two questions. And thank you again. Thank you very are much. You, um are you so like? Uh, are you actually think ab thinking about, um, let's say, smartphones, uh, with which I began and deliberately ended this this talk? Yeah, I don't know if I'm the uh, right person to, uh, or if I have any author authoritative comment on that at 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 all. But I mean that my. Perhaps I only have opinion, you know, like based on reading and observing and using those devices, you know, they some of you may have a very different different kind of opinion, you know. But I I I I, I started with this Elon Musk's basically rather simple comment, you know, like just saying that phone user is a cyborg and um I guess we 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 can ask you know yes if that is so so w what what does what what contributes to that because in in some sense i guess that we can say that the smartphone is a tool we have had tools for thousands of years you know as a, in that that sense so so is 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 that tool very different from a hammer 
that we used to build build things or, or um, sword to defend us in the medieval medieval times or, or something like something like that and um, I guess one way of argu answering would would definitely be would be to say that yes it is a very different kind of tools and and in that sense the um, I think uh, an important element is the uh, certain kind of the um, saturation so the continuity of its use I, because many tools um, are used frequently but not continuously <laughs> so so no no human being will use a hammer or even a sword as a such a so like continu continuous um, on on such a continual basis as we use let's say the smartphones and of course you know that there's a, a lot of uh, uh, research about like the the intervals that people are can are having you know between those acts of using it and and that, that it is getting shorter and shorter so so my personal feeling is that it does have very likely it does have huge uh, impacts on 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 subjectivity in that sense so if if the idea that we you constantly handle uh, that kind of device uh, in a in a material sense defines some cy cyborg like elements so i do personally i see that the cyborg logic we could say is is being inter internalized by that de device but of course that leads to this kind of huge discussion which is partly medical discussion and psychoanalytic discussion psychological discussion but i showed that just a little one slide about the idea how the interest in the um smartphones in dreams so the uh so they so there seems to be quite a phenomenon where people are uh, seeing dreams about smartphone use and and i think that that is that is perfectly person well very very important so this idea about like cyborg being uh, not just something material or something that functions and does things for the body but actually be becomes a function of the mind uh, i think that this is an issue that that is would be worth researching much more than it has been researched and um and this is a sort of like one motivation behind the second part of my talk trying to sort of like look at and understand how the this certain kind of imaginary about the cyborg how how that has been sort of like happening much 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 earlier so this uh, most interesting example for me is this what i towards the end was just very briefly uh, saying about the photo photography so the idea how in the 19th century this many examples both textual and uh, uh, pictorial visual examples uh, seem to be saying that the idea that people started using photographic cameras was actually leading already to that kind of merger so and so so like you saw those pictures like people on the hood and just the, the like a like a cyclops one one huge eye replacing the human uh, human two eyes and things like that so these ideas where i have somehow re related i think with a certain kind of this subjectivity so the ideas of um, uh, ideas about how that seem to be um, a certain kind of affecting certain kind of functions of the of the human mind and the way how it made sense of the world so i can ju just say that i i think that the question you are asking for me is a very essential question and um, i don't know if i have any any final or so like answers it is a it's such a huge area that there there are this space for many many voices and probably for many different voices as well thank you thank you una pregunta más sí yeah uh, thank you for your really inspiring talk um i was all the time uh, thinking about the relationship between uh, cyborgs and monsters 
because you mentioned monsters. For, for me, a cyborg isn't a monster. <laughs> Uh, so that would uh, would be interesting uh, to just to um, know about your your opinion about that. And another difference for me is between post-humanism and transhumanism, uh, which I think also is important. Uh, thinking about Stiegler, for example, and other yeah. uh, thinkers, because um, post-humanism uh, is is more uh, it is a more critical approach about these figures or topos, yeah. um, wh whereas uh, transhumanism is, is uh, just thinking about uh, yeah. the, 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 um, the quality of man just to uh, make it better, uh, make a yes. better man, no? that the, yes. we, we, saw, we saw in your, uh, in your presentation. That's so, um, and this leads me to, a, to another differentiation uh, uh, between um, media and technology. Because uh, I thought uh, I, I thought when I saw these um, figures, um, the camera eye, which is uh, which is of course a, a big topic, and um, we can talk about this from McLuhan. You know, uh, the extension of of the eye of the human eye, of course, is the camera eye. So, uh, are these cyborgs or are these media borgs? <laughs> you know, I, I thought about that. It's. Uh, Cyborg for me, it's much more technolo technological than uh, mm. medial. You know, I, I, I uh, associate the cyborg with technological figures and uh, the internet and, and stuff like that, and less with uh, media uh, like like cameras or, or stuff like that. But that's only uh, something I, I thought when I when I when I really uh, realized uh, what, what you what you are showing. Uh, it's so interesting, but I don't. Know, I don't know if you can answer that, but uh, maybe some yeah. hints about these d differences. Thank you. So I mean, yes. I mean, uh, so you um, you made so many uh, interesting points that I don't. I'm not sure I even remember all of them them any any more right right away. But but first of all, you you uh, raised some conceptual terms. So from the um, so post-humanism and uh, transhumanism and the and this is this is of course um, correct that the um, I think that those those uh, terms uh, exist in sort of like different places in terms of the discourse you know like and and it seems to me that so there's uh, actually the um, uh, Francesco Ferrando the uh, philosopher has uh, wrote a really good paper that tries to, and and also actually turned it into a book recently that tries to sort of like make make sense into this, this about of this uh, kind of a so we say conceptual cacophony or mess uh, between those and and several other concepts but i mean that so that 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 article it was in the philosophical journal existence um i can i can send it to f after the talk to Fernando, if he wants to put it up on the on the, on the side, but so yeah, so so transhumanism is a concept that is often used in a certain kind of a affirmative way by those people who identify themselves as transhumans. So where this they, where this this is definitely not about a monster, you know, in the sense at least from their point of view, you know, like uh, Harbison, for example. I saw the picture of the guy with the with the antenna, antenna supposedly inserted in the head. So Arbison, uh, it seems like identifies as a as a transhumanist, you know, like who's who's like like adding those things in a in a positive. Way. Many people also taking all kinds of uh, sort of like elements inserted under the skin in that that particular sense. So, so it raises uh, questions about how that term is used in the like a critical discourse and that kind of thing. So we, we have other terms as well. So it is obviously, as you mentioned, so this is a this is a point for a theoretical debate. So about how to how to relate those those um, uh, questions. Uh, so th so those terms terms with it with each other, and. Um, 
And, and then you made this um, point about cyborg or media, me, media borg or that kind of thing. This is, of course, is, is another very interesting question, you know, like, because, I mean, if we, if we say that, um, say that this kind of a, a photographer hiding under the hood with his camera is a, is a media borg, Maybe we should say that the uh, smartphone user user is also a media media borg, you know that that kind of thing. It's a it's a good question. Uh, of course, um, I I encounter this question personally very often, and I don't have once again a clear answer uh, because um, so my work is often identified uh, as media archaeology. And, and sometimes it comes to m my mind that this media in the media archaeology may in itself be problematic because it it's maybe is ex somehow like uh, limiting or kind of like framing something that should really be more like uh, ex like extending and uh, being being open in the sense maybe media is a little bit old old narrow narrowly understood concept when the when the world of technological uh, systems and devices is 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 is, is being broadened in, in many ways, you know, in that sense, so the um, it seems to me that 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 you are right in a, in I mean definitely technic in a, in a in a theoretical sense you must be right in the sense that not all the problematics raised by the term uh, cyborg can be so in a way like brought back to the problematics of media. I think that um, I'm okay to think about the uh, photographing uh, person as a cyborg, but that means, of course, that the cyborg is a broader broader concept and broader category within which maybe this this media media borg is an, is an one, one form or element. So I think it depends on how we uh, yeah, how we how we theoretically want to class classify these things brings more to my mind my little bit like a tongue-in-cheek example about this um, gadget head and uh, object head. You know, when I I saw the pictures that inspired me about this these uh, human figures with the uh, heads uh, uh, replaced by technological devices, I started calling them gadget heads. But then, of course, I started noting that internet there can be figures with a flower pot head and uh, and all kinds of like uh, other types of heads, and 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 um, these were called on the social in the social media object heads. So obviously, then with the same logic, gadget head is a subcategory of object head. You know, so it leads to this kind of theoretical. Classification. I think there's plenty of work to be done. Still, it's not, it's not, it's not a work work that's finished. But those are. I think it's a very interesting and uh, essential questions that you are asking. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for your lecture. I'm gonna try to structure my question as organized as I can. Um, can you speak a little bit louder? Yes. Sorry. Um, First of all, thank you for your lecture, and I'm going to try to say the question as organized as I can. Um, but do you think of the concept of cyborg as a state of the body, or as a group of actions that look forward to emulate our experience through, or emulate or mediate our experience through technology or through other material objects or dimensions or maybe both or maybe one mm. corresponds to the other or maybe you already said it but <laughs> mm. that's the question if i understand your question uh, right so you basically ask whether it is a certain kind of a s state state of the being a state of the body or or a certain kind of a cell like kind of um more like uh A set of functions or functionalities or possibilities or that kind of, that kind of thing. Uh, I I guess that if if this is what would you ask, you know, probably probably we should say that it is both uh, in a certain kind of a dynamic 
relationship with the, with each other you know because the the none of the none of the um extensions whether whether they are physical like a like a body mounted things or inserted things make any 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 sense uh, without a certain kind of a practice a certain kind of like a kind of a more fluid model where these things are having having impact and, and being impacted by others so if if this is a more like a philosophical question so the probably we could say that the cyborg has both both dimensions you know and uh, one dimension is a certain kind of state of being and one of one of one of the uh, one one dimension is a state of action or or series of states of actions and uh, and these things are somehow i mean constantly like uh, they are inseparable from each other so possibly something like this you know so uh, i would i would i would think so but it's i think it's it's a question about the certain kind of a philosophy of 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 the cyborg you know like so that you are asking if i understand it right So if you want to, can I show you um, one, just I mentioned the, um, this very remarkable text, if you haven't seen that, so this, this is, a, you can download for free on the internet, so this is a really very fine study by Francesca Ferrando, Post-Humanism, Transhumanism, Anti-Humanism, Meta-Humanism and New Materialisms. I I will I will uh, send this text for 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 you if you are interested but you can also get it on the internet but I I recommend very much you know this is philosophically really uh, well argued uh, argued argued paper and uh, definitely worth reading it it gives uh, answers to some of the questions we heard heard, heard today Thank mm -hmm. you.